Hi, everyone. Good morning. Joining you from San Francisco and from Washington, D.C. My name is Risa Eldon, and I'm here on behalf of Ivy Project Management Tool. And Kimberly Merletti from KMM Consulting is joining us live. Just to give you a little bit of background about me and what Ivy is, and then we'll give you a background about Kimberly, and then we'll let her steer and tell you everything you need to know about your cash flow. And notice how I very purposefully did not use the A word for accounting. We don't want to scare you off, but we really want to help you be able to manage your business more efficiently so you can make more money. So what Ivy is, is a business management tool for interior designers to help you streamline the everyday from proposals to time to creating FF and E schedules. We allow you to work from the cloud so you can use Ivy on the go from our mobile app. And we'll chat a little bit more about Ivy at the end of our session. I um, previously had experience managing an interior design firm, so I know where all of you are coming from. There's a lot of moving pieces. And the idea is to really streamline, centralize all of those moving parts. I'm very excited because I personally know Kimberly Merletti. Um, she's worked with several clients that I know in the Bay Area and beyond. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Kimberly. She is now based out of Washington, D.C. and has 20 years of experience working in the accounting um, arena for companies such as Swinerton Builders and Martin Group. She has her master's in accounting from Golden Gate University located in San Francisco. KMM Consulting's clientele include a diverse group of service-based companies with a main focus on luxury interior design, construction, and architectural firms. The goal of her firm is to make the businesses she works for as profitable as they can be by educating them on accounting and cash flow management. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Kimberly Merletti to the floor. And Kimberly, I will let you take over and tell us what we're going to cover today. Well, I wanted to keep this really basic. Um, it, I'm sure everyone right now, and I go off script a little bit and I talk with my hands. I'm Sicilian and I know the people out there, some of them know me personally. So thank you. I know some of my clients are sitting out there. Um, thank you for supporting me. Um, and thank you, Ivy and Risa, for allowing me to do this. Uh, this next hour is gonna be basically how to manage your money coming in and out of your company. There is not one book that I can find that explains this in a basic terms. So I started doing this for my clients years ago because I kept getting questions, Kim, how much of, the, of my bank money is actually mine? So let's say you have 250 grand in your bank account. Do you know, Can you, are you able to say how much that goes to your company? Like that's your profitability? Most designers can't. And usually when I take on a client, I find this out that they don't have enough money in their bank account to pay what are called liabilities. Now, I try to not use accounting terms as much as possible because if you knew these accounting terms, you wouldn't need someone like me. So this is basically this next hour is going to be about making sure this is understandable. And I've tried really hard to put this in some notes in this PowerPoint slide. And yeah, I'm old school. I call it PowerPoint still. I the younger crowd calls it stacks or something like that, which I think is pretty funny. Um, and if you're not laughing through this seminar, then uh, sorry, but I try to bring a little humor to what I do. Otherwise, you're going to fall asleep. So again, you might as well just have fun with accounting in this next hour because <laughs> this is just a really basic formula on how you're going to understand what physical cash in the bank is actually your money. So let's just start. The agenda was basically what we posted to get all of you to sign up. And I really, um, I'm hoping you'll get a copy of these slides because I really need you all to take notes because this is going to be something you want to refer back to on a regular basis. Right now we're in this tax season scramble. If you don't already have your accountant, bookkeeper, or CPA knocking at your door for your financials right now, then you don't, you don't have the right people on your team. So let's just put that out there. Um, they should be knocking on your door. It's February 27th and corporate returns are due on the 15th of March. Um, and personal returns are due on April 15th. So by April 15th, you have to pay some taxes. 
income tax and federal and state levels and maybe at the local level, depending on where you live. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to follow these five points that you see on your screen to get through this process. And again, I don't want you to be scared. I know it's a little scary to say accounting and cash and balance sheet. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to break it down and get the basic understanding on how to manage the money in your bank. Now, to start out, what you must understand is that the money in your bank account right now is a moving target. And what I mean by that is that you need to know that money's coming in and money's coming out. In the accounting world, we call this float, stuff that's between the bank and who you paid or between you getting a check-in from a client and it hitting the bank. There's sometimes a day or two, or depending on your bank, could be a week. Um, what you want to understand is what your cash in the bank is physically yours. So if you were to pick up and move to France and just say the heck with this business, how much would you bring with you? I wonder if anyone can answer that question. That's usually what I start with. I say, if you want to move to France and stop being an interior designer, you know how much you have in your pocket. Most likely people do not know the answer to that question. So we're going to look at the start with the balance sheet and just identify what a balance sheet is because before I start throwing deductions at you and terms, you need to just under the, understand the basics of how to read a balance sheet. When we go through the balance sheet on the next page, we are going to just get some basic terminology out of the way. And this is why this is in PowerPoint so that you guys can make some notes, write down some things. And I know all of you are probably come back to your notes and be like, what did she mean? And you can always throw these terms in Google and get an explanation as well. Um, or you can sign up with me and I can help you with that. Um, money flowing in and out of your business is the biggest mystery. So let's start with what a balance sheet is. Okay, here is a bunch of wah, 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 Charlie Brown teacher. I know this is probably what, <laughs> what you hear when you start to read something like this. Um, well, I felt the same way about interior design to be honest with you. I didn't know what a sconce was. I didn't know what a sham was. Um, and my mother's an interior designer, so I should know better. I hung out with my dad more, so let's just put it out there. Um, so the balance sheet is basically your company's historical records. And I'm really not going to use accounting terms. Okay, so I want you to understand the basics. Balance sheet is your company's history. So from the day you started your business to today's date, that's pretty much your economic health. OK, the asset section and we're going to look at a fake balance sheet. And what's really important is you don't share your balance sheet with complete strangers. It's like a Social Security card. Do not show this to anyone you don't trust other than your CPA or certified professional in the accounting realm. Um, an asset in your balance sheet is basically bringing value to your company. So assets can be accounts receivable, cash in the bank, security deposits, um, things like that are assets. OK. Next section of your balance sheet, a liability, is basically everything that's going to take money out of your company eventually. In the accounting world, we have two sections we call current liabilities and long-term liabilities. Now, the difference between the two is that if you had to pay, you have to pay a credit card balance every month, or you have to pay interest on a loan that you took out every month, that's a current liability. A long-term liability could be a loan that you took out that you don't have to pay or look at for at least over six months. And the accounting world is that's how we define what a current and a long-term liability is. So we're going to focus on liabilities today, okay? Um, we're not going to focus on assets and equity, but I want you to have these definitions because you need to understand them to run your business. Equity is the amount of funds that you put into your business to keep it running. So if you run out of cash and you have to donate or donate, give your business 50 grand, that's called an owner contribution. And when you take money out as an owner, that's called an owner draw. Now these might sound, these terms might sound really familiar to you because you, they've been thrown at you by your, again, your accounting staff, which could be your bookkeeper, your CPA, your enrolled agent, all of them throw these terms at you and they expect you to understand them. Um, I try to demystify how to do accounting and interior design and architecture and general contracting uh, because I know you guys are out there when your heads are spinning and trying to do installs and you just don't have time for this. Well, I'm telling you right now, you should at least make an hour a week to make time to understand your cash in the bank. And that's what we're gonna go through right now. 
So here's an example of just a basic Jones Consulting Group. So I pulled this off Google. Um, they have all these examples. And basically, this is the structure of a balance sheet. Now, over here, we have liabilities. I hope everyone can see my mousy. Um, sorry, I'm a little old fashioned. Um, these see when I was talking non-current liabilities and current liabilities. This is not an insurance design firm because, and this is not a real company because again, balance sheets are confidential and they should not be published. So these are why these examples live on the internet and you can just pull them off. Um, so you see these liabilities here, we need to be able to pay these. And in interior design, we have special liabilities and we're going to go through those right now. Okay. So this is where you start to take notes guys. Um, some of examples of liabilities in interior design, and we're talking just interior design right now, and they might vary if you're an architect or a, a general contractor. Um, but the theory is the same. Everyone knows they have to pay sales tax because they're buying with their resale license in every single state and you have to turn on and pay the state. Now those incur in certain states at different times. So you really must understand when those are due from your CPA or your enrolled agent to get the current state law and understand when those are due because those are amounts you should have in your bank account to pay at any given time, okay? Next are credit card balances. Now you may be paying off credit cards or you may pay them off in full every single month. Either way, these are amounts that should be in your bank right now to pay off right now, okay? Loans, we talked about these, these are also in the form of lines of credit. You can have these, you may not have balances on them, but if you do, these would have to, interest would have to be paid monthly and you can try to schedule when you wanna pay these off. Those are sometimes long-term asset liabilities. So you may pay those off in six months. So we're gonna go over in Excel, very, very basic. So don't get scared by the word Excel, how to make these calculations and make sure you're accounting for all four of those areas, okay? And I put in a bullet point, even though I just said it, I want you to just understand, you should be able to pay any of these items above at any given time, okay? If you cannot say yes to that question, then we you need to do some cash analysis. And we're gonna go over that in a second. Um, the next thing you need to be able to pay at any given time are vendor liabilities. Sometimes people will call this work in progress. Um, these are for goods that have not been completed. And what I mean by this is any amount still owed to a vendor before it's in the client's home, for example, if you have a 50, per, if you made a custom sofa, it's 10 grand, and you put a deposit down to your vendor for 50% uh, of that 10 grand sofa, you still owe another five grand. Well, there may be a week lead time on that custom made sofa. It may be six months lead time. Lead time just means in the future, you should have in your bank account that five grand set aside to pay that bill at any given time. Even though you know it's not due for six months or a week or three months, you should still have it in your bank account, okay? We don't want the false, uh, we don't wanna, un, we don't wanna have a false comfort of seeing $200,000 in the bank and being like, hey, that's all mine. We're, we're trying to get you away from thinking that. And I know, I know all of you have thought that at one time. So, and there's no judgment, no judgment at all. I'm just letting you know, I know what's going through your mind. Um, I've been doing this. Uh, for big construction companies and architectural firms until I got into interior design. And I found that interior design is probably the most complicated business out of the three to manage cash because of all these different moving parts, vendor liabilities, loan amounts, credit card amounts. They are constantly changing, but I'm gonna give you a very basic tool on how to manage this money. Okay, the next thing, overhead costs. These are, people will call these business expenses, okay? So you they're called actually administrative expenses, um, but they're mainly called overhead. So you wanna understand on a monthly basis what your expenses are. And some examples of overhead expenses will be payroll, rent, or insurance. These are not related to projects. And notice I put that in bold. What I want you to understand is that you have to pay these expenses regardless of the projects you bring in. If you pull one statement out of this entire slide, this is what I want you to understand. You are not, these are not project costs. So you must, must, must have 
this money in your bank account to pay your monthly expenditures. Usually I always like to tell my clients, if you want to save enough money, save about six months of overhead expenditures because you never know when you're going to hit a recession or you're, you, you know, you hit the summer. I see a lot of companies uh, lose production over the summertime because all the people that want their houses designed go to Europe or go on vacation. And we all know what happens uh, no matter where you are in the United States. Um, also, I would like to give a shout out to my peeps in San Francisco. I miss you guys. I just moved to DC, but I just want to say hi to everyone in the Bay Area. Um, I miss you guys lots. Uh, anyway, moving on. Um, and everyone knows overhead expenditures are quite high in the Bay Area is, you know, just because of the market there. Okay, capital expenditures. This is what I like to refer to as my wish list. Um, when my clients come to me and they're like, Kim, I have this in my bank account. Can I afford to do a show house? Um, can I afford new furniture? Can I buy more inventory? And my answer always to my client is, I don't know, let's do a cash calculation so we can determine how much you have left over to pay for these items. And we all know these marketing and advertising is a large part of an interior design budget. It is, let's just be honest, you guys really have to push to get your name recognition out there and you publicated, you publicated, you want to get published and you want to get seen. And this is a lot of the overhead. Um, this is a lot of capital expenditure. Okay. This is not overhead. This is not project costs, but you, I do not encourage my clients to spend money on capital expenditures until we know that everything else is covered. Okay. And like I said, I put this sentence in here, even though I just said it, you should only make these purchases when you know you have enough cash to do so. Okay. I want you to star this. Okay. You, if you are thinking, oh, I want to do a show house or I want to do a uh, hire a PR person, I want you to stop in your tracks, do the calculation I'm going to teach you in a few minutes and then decide if you can afford that PR person or do a show house. Okay. Um, and you need to be able to pay your payroll. Okay. So payroll is really important for those that have large payrolls that uh, is, cannot be uh, mismanaged because payroll doesn't have any leeway. It's due on a certain date by law in every state and you must make your payroll. So, um, okay. We're going to start really just with a basic calculation. And this is where I'm going to go a little bit slower. I do have a tendency to talk fast. Those that know me know this about me. Um, again, I talk with my hands and, you know, it's a typical Sicilian. Um, but first of all, I when I do this calculation with my client, I say, I need you to log into your bank account. I want you to tell me exactly what you have in your bank account as of right now. So let's say I did that with one client and this is the amount they gave me. They have a savings account of 35 grand and checking is 75,000. So I just take those, put them in Excel, add them up and I have $110,000. Great, wonderful. Next calculation. What are your credit card balances you have to pay off? Remember we were talking about credit card balances in the prior slide and loans. We need to identify what those liabilities are right now as of today. So then I turn to my client and I say, log into your credit card account. Now notice I'm not having my client go to their database. Um, I don't know one interior design firm that has an accountant that sits there for them every single day and enters a transaction as it occurs. So to do this properly, this cash analysis, we have to go directly into these websites for the bank to get our cash balances and into the credit card websites and lines of credit to get these balances. Okay. As of today's date, remember we're looking at a shot in time. So if I were putting this in Excel, I date this Excel spreadsheet to 27, 2019, and I would keep this as history, but we're going to go over the historical um, reference at the end of the uh, presentation because it's got its place um, in the discussion. So we're going to do that in a minute. Um, but let's pull our credit card balance. So I have them go to their website. They pull up their Chase credit card. They've got 15. American Express is 12. And their line of credit is $2,000. So we add that all up and we have a balance. So let's hang on to that balance and move to the next action. Work in progress. Remember we were talking about vendor liabilities? That's the remaining 
amount you still owe your vendor as of right now. Now, here's the tricky part, you guys. This number, you're probably like, how in the heck do I find this number? So depending on what software program you're using, you will want to go into and actually referring to Ivy, since Ivy is letting me talk to you today, let's just use an example from Ivy. An open purchase order report would be a, a valid document to get what you still owe to your vendors. In other softwares, it's called can be called the vendor liability report. It could be called the work in progress report. Um, it just depends on the software. Now, you probably know what softwares I'm referring to. There aren't a whole lot out there, but in IV, it is called open purchase orders and you can run it through the report section in the IV program. Um, the next is the sales tax liability. Now, what you can do if you are using IV, you can run the sales tax liability through QuickBooks or you can run it through the report section of IV called sales tax liability. Um, and again, there are sales tax reports and the other two design softwares that do this kind of, well, that work for interior designers. So you want to either, if you're unsure on how to get these numbers, this is some, this is an area where you need to probably get your CPA, your bookkeeper or accountant in house involved. They should know this number just as well as you do. Now they don't need to know how to do what we're doing right now, which they probably know how to do this. I would think any accountant did would know how to do what I'm doing. This is not brain science when I'm teaching you for an accountant that's been in the field for a while. But what your accountant should know, because this is specific to this interior, into the industry of interior design and not other, other industries don't have these issues with uh, work in progress slash vendor liability or a sales tax liability that's constantly evolving. Okay. Like I said, in your softwares, as you guys are creating purchase orders, this changes on a daily basis. So this process that I'm having you go through right now, you should probably do weekly. Um, and then you're going to see how it changes over the week. And you'll probably get so good with your cash amounts that you could do this in your sleep. Um, and I'm giving you the tools today to be able to do this. But I think this is the reason I'm kind of staying on this one slide. This is a difficult area. Work in progress slash vendor liability is basically what you still owe your vendors as of today. So to get this number, you will go in and run those reports that I was referring to, open purchase order report or a work in progress report, it's called as well. Um, and then sales tax, you can run a sales tax report in any of the interior design softwares as of today's date, okay? So if these numbers, you pull these numbers and they seem really high, then you probably don't have a clean database. So you really, really need to make sure that your database is up to date. And what I mean by that is if you've proposed items to a client and they decided not to get them, but they're still sitting in there, that's gonna affect these numbers. So my, I'm not gonna swear, but everyone knows that I say, mm, if you don't put good data into your database, you're not getting good data out. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what database you're using. If you don't follow that standard, you might as well just not use a database altogether if you're not going to put the effort into keeping your database clean. So in IV, those items that are created um, need to have valid information in them. And the same goes for the other two softwares. You guys have to have updated item information. So if a client, you propose things to a client and they decide not to get them, you need to make them inactive or pull them out because they will affect these balances. Okay, moving on. The next deduction is overhead. We defined overhead as non-project expenses. So let's remember that you have to pay these even though um, you don't have any projects, you have to still pay these bills, okay? So these bills come up to roughly the same amount every month depending on how you run your firm. Um, I call this the monthly nut. If you can just maybe take your 2018 numbers and divide by 12, um, you could go to your overhead section, divide by 12, and you can say that's probably roughly what it's going to be each month. Just keep in mind if you hire or give yourself a raise or you move to a new building and your rent doubles, which happens a lot in the Bay Area right now because this has been a major question in the Bay Area, um, it will alter this number. Um, for our example, I put in some numbers just to show you how to do the calculation. 
But just understand that, again, if you're not, don't have a full set of reconciled books for 2018, these numbers probably won't be accurate. My suggestion is to take, since we're in year end currently, and I probably, um, you had January closed already, great. You could take that number as a rough estimate of your monthly nut, or you could take 2018 and divide your overhead by 12. Um, again, if this all sounds great in theory and you're having trouble understanding my calculations, um, I don't normally sit here and sell myself, but you can sign up for a free consult with me and I can help you do this. If it's the only thing I do for you, that's fine. If if you need someone to walk and hold your hand through it, that's fine. I have clients that come to me once and I teach them this stuff and I don't hear from them again, which is great because then they're on and doing it. I'm hoping they're doing it. Um, but then I also have clients that see me every single month because they rely on, oh, Kim, I did the calculation, but can you make sure it seems okay? So if this is completely overwhelming, do not beat yourselves up. If you knew how to do this stuff, you wouldn't be in, you would be in the business of accounting and interior design, but you're just in interior design. Okay. Um, again, if you threw me in the middle of a bunch of, a, in a house and told me to design it, I literally would have a panic attack. I'm not going to lie. Um, so we all have our specialties. Let's just put it out there. <laughs> um, okay. So here's everything. I pulled it all together. And the reason I put this on your slides is so that you could make notes. So all the calculations I just threw at you, I put in one spreadsheet. Now, as we pulled all these numbers, we pulled them as of February 27th, 2019, right? So look at the cash on hand at the bottom of the screen. The cash on hand is what you have in the bank that's physically yours as of today. Again, it's, it's a shot in time, guys. You have $46,000 to escape to France as of today. So if you shut down your business and you pay all these bills, and you get on a plane and go to France, you have $46,822.93 to spend on whatever you want. Um, so let's just go through these basic calculations. So I took my cash, I subtracted the 29,000, I subtracted my sales tax and work in progress, and I subtracted my monthly overhead. And that's how I got my number. So it's basic math, just basic math. I have no formulas, no fancy stuff. It's just basic. I subtracted this number. Oops, sorry. Um, that would be the fact that I am not savvy at tech, so I apologize. Um, hold on one sec. Let me get back to the screen. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. Oh, you guys are so good to me. Um, let's just go straight to that. There we go. Ha! It's not as uh, dumb as she looks, gang. Okay. Um, I can do calculations. I just can't do technology. Okay. Um, this is... Oh, I see what's going on with this slide. It's a little out of whack. Okay. We'll just play around with this. Okay. So I know... Let's um, actually... Let's do this. This is my Excel spreadsheet. I'm not sure what's going on with that slide. Um, here's the calculation. So I did this in Excel. And if any of you know that when you're looking at a calculation in Excel, you're basically looking at, you can click on it and it shows you the calculation. So there's that basic calculation I was just talking about. Okay. So now we're going to get into our future spending. Okay. So let's go back to our PowerPoint slide, even though I am not savvy with it. So I apologize, you guys. Whoop. There we go. Um, your income taxes. Now we are in the state. I know people right now are like, how am I going to pay my taxes? I know that's a common fear. So especially with the new tax plan that came out in 2018, things are going to be a little um, unfamiliar, to be honest with you. OK, so we're going to look at our accounts receivable. Um, and actually, I like the Excel version of this better, so I'm going to go over here. Here is my tax calculation. I have accounts receivable right now for my fake firm that I'm working in right now doing this cash analysis. I'm going to my accounts receivable report. Now, if you accounts receivable are invoices, you've invoiced your client that you have not received money for yet. This balance really should be monitored twice a month. 
if this balance, you have no idea what makes up that 75 grand in our example. If you go to your accounts receivable, you go to your bookkeeper account and you say, I need an accounts receivable report and they give you something and you look at it and you're like, I have no idea what's going on. I want you to force your bookkeeper slash accountant to go over it with you. Sit them down and say, why is this number like this? I need to understand. And if you don't come out of that understanding where that number is coming from, then I think you should probably give me a call <laughs> because then the bookkeeper um, needs some help. Um, your accounts receivable is a very important number to, uh, to refer to at least twice a month. Um, basically, it's future cash coming down the pipeline. So see, there's our cash on hand number, guys, right there. See that? Now we're going to add in our future accounts receivable because now we're going to go past what we have today and project what else needs to come out or go into our balance. Okay, so we're, we're not going to France. We're actually going to stay as interior designers and we're going to continue to do our analysis here. Okay, I highlighted this as future liabilities. And you know why? Because these are things that are due down the pipeline. And I made up these numbers um, for income tax because right now we're in a, a period where we probably still owe some 2018 and we need to start putting money aside for 2019. You have January. I don't know if you've done a budget. That's another way to project what kind of tax you're going to pay. Um, your CPA should be able to help you with this. Um, if you go to your CPA and you say, I need to do some tax planning and they give you this blank look, I would probably find anyone just to be completely honest. Um, I have a handful of CPAs that I absolutely love that are very aggressive in tax planning. And because you're in an industry that needs this aggressiveness, you need to find a CPA that understands your industry in this manner. And all I'm saying is they need to, when I say tax planning, they need to sit you down in the middle of the year and say, okay, let's look at your net income and see if you're above or below what you should be paying into the feds or the state or the local government. Okay. It's going to be really important to communicate more with your CPA so that you can understand what you have to pay in six months, three months or next month. Okay. So obviously taxes are due on April 15th. So I put April 15th and then I also had a, a projected for my 19 liability, which is also due on the exact same day. This is why we all hate April 15th. Um, so what I did is I took this calculation. See that? I took my cash on hand. I added my accounts receivable. Okay. Then I subtracted this entire amount. Okay. Now I got a, a total of $98,072.93. So if I still wanted to leave to France, I need to make sure I got all my accounts receivables in. And then I could leave for France with $98,000. But your money is right here. So remember that question we started with, you guys? What money in the bank is mine? So we started off with 110. Kim, how much of that is actually physically my money? Okay, let's do it. Let's scroll back down. 98,000 of that is your money. Okay. So that is how you do this simple calculation. Okay. Now, sometimes when you do this calculation, this number is going to be negative. So let's just do a little scare technique. Sorry, I don't mean to, but I think knowledge is power. Let's take our bank balance down. Look what happens. Cash on hand is negative. Now, that doesn't mean that you need, you're going out of business. I don't want you to freak out when you see this. But I do this with a number of new clients, and this most likely is negative, which is why they hired me. <laughs> and they want to know, how do I get that into the positive? Okay, so that is a whole nother class, how to get that into the positive. But what I'm saying is now you know you're not, you don't have cash on hand to run your business. And you need to start figuring out how to reverse that. Okay, so when you see a negative cash on hand number like this, because then if you go down, notice that that with your if I didn't have my future AR, I'd probably be in the hole here right too. OK, so just so you know, when you do this exercise and you get a negative cash on hand, you probably need to look at your spending. This also means I don't have any extra money for capital expenditures. So no, I have to have put my marketing on hold. I have to put any new furniture on hold, any inventory purchases on hold until this number goes into the positive. Now, let's switch it back to the happy 
cash balance. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So we'll just put some more money in here. This was 35. But let's scroll back down and see what that does. So it puts us back to our 98. Now notice I have a little blurb here for capital expenditures. This is my wish list. Sometimes I actually put wish list instead of capital expenditures. Okay. I put in my showcase house, roughly how much it's going to cost, any new furniture. And I say that's projected. Now, what I, the reason I put it down here is so I can sit here and go, okay, I have money to spend on this, even though I've paid my taxes, I still have money. Okay, so that should give you a comfort level that as soon as you collect some AR, you can go out and spend some money and maybe sign up for a showcase house or buy some new furniture or buy some inventory for those that have um, uh, retail spaces. Okay, so I'm hoping this, this basic calculation is helpful to you. Um, let's go back to our PowerPoint slide. Okay. Um, this was the calculation we just did. The money as of today is your money. And then we're going to go into capital expenditures. And again, this is our wish list. This is the money you spent only when you have money to spare. Okay. So let's just, we went through that. I tried to go as slow as possible. I'm sorry if it was too fast. Um, but just remember that go back to your notes and refer to your notes. And I hopefully you'll, you have copies of these PowerPoint slides where you can go back and, and calculate, you put your numbers right next to my examples. And I think that'll help. Um, I'm a visual learner. I didn't learn accounting overnight. Um, it was very difficult for me to get to where I am in life to understand these numbers inside and out. And I actually do it every hour of every day for, almost sometimes six or seven days a week. So just understand that this is this can be a little difficult at first, but you need to go through the exercise of doing it so that you can understand what that money in your bank account is physically yours, okay? Now, again, I'm just gonna let you know, do not beat yourselves up if that number is negative, okay? That just means you have some work to do, okay? You have to look at your revenue. Are you collecting it on time? Are you getting your invoices out on time? Okay, those are things that you want to consider when your cash flow is weak. Don't necessarily go straight to the expenses and be like, oh, I have to cut this, this, and this. That's a knee jerk reaction for most of my clients. I would start with your revenue flow when you have a negative cash balance. You look at the patterns on collecting revenue. Do you have a large AR? Are you getting billings out in a timely manner? Um, all of that contributes to cash inflow. Okay. Cash outflow is easy and we don't want to spend cash. So that's actually easier to track than cash inflow. But when you see you're in the negative, you really want to go straight to the revenue collection. Um, and if you've answered all those and none of that is your problem, then there's probably a bigger problem going on in your company, which is probably, I have to be honest, this is a whole nother session, but it's probably has a lot to do with time management of you and your staff and your production levels, because that is directly related to bottom lines in interior design. Um, for those that don't know me, I am religious with my firms that I work with about tracking their time to the point of being annoying. Um, to, <laughs> and some people are, get, um, I talk to staff members for principals. They have me talk to their staff. I just talked to a company yesterday and their staff was, um, how do I put this without sounding like a mafia person? <laughs> they were scared, but they were scared straight to be like, okay, we need to start tracking our time because now we fully understand it's directly related to cash flow. Um, so that's my tangent for the day. Um, so let's go over why doing this every single week. And what I would recommend you guys do is do this at the same time every week. So pick Monday at 8 a.m. or Friday at 5 p.m. Wednesday or when your bookkeeper comes, you guys can do it together. And, you know, listen to your bookkeepers and accountants and CPAs. Some of them really will have helpful hints. Um, and don't be afraid to ask them to use non-accounting terminology. When they start throwing accounting terms at you, I mean, you might as well just go pull out a dictionary because <laughs> it's going to be confusing. So you want to not be afraid to ask your accountant, please define what accounts receivable means. Please define what vendor liability means or how I can pull this up. 
Um, and again, you guys have my contact information now. So if you wanted to do a new client consult and we could just talk about how I could help your bookkeeper, that is fine too. Um, the, the next thing I want to just talk about um, in this summary, and I'm trying to leave enough time at the end for questions because I know questions are very important. Um, so let's just go over the four areas that this will help with. Um, so what we just did will help you understand your profit. We just kind of basically went through that because the cash in your bank that's left over after you do this analysis is basically known as your profit. Um, again, it's profit as of that day. So don't be confused by that. It's not the net profit that should be on your income statement. This is a shot in time. You're doing this as of February 27th. Um, completing this each week, again, we just went over, will help you develop patterns in your spending. I guarantee you, without consciously knowing you're doing it, you will start to consciously say, okay, my vendor liability doubled. I better figure out why. And you'll go into the report and you'll see it. You'll see the, the doubling of the amount. This is going to help. This process is going to help you guys understand your numbers better. Okay. And you're not even going to realize it. Just doing each week, you are going to have a better understanding of your numbers just as a side effect of doing this exercise. Um, you now identified all the liabilities in your company. I cannot tell you guys how many times I go to a client and they have no idea what a liability is or what it means or they don't know any of their credit card balances or their loan amounts. That is a no-no. And that, I'm not saying that's a no-no in interior design. I'm saying in any business, you need to have a full scope of what you need to pay out to your vendors, your bank, your institutions that are loaning you money, such as like lines of credit, credit cards. Um, you need to definitely make sure you understand your liabilities with your government organizations. Um, and I know saying that scares you, but this is what I would do if you get a government letter with a balance on it, scan it and send it to your CPA. <laughs> That's why you're paying the big bucks. Um, actually, when I have my clients, if they, I have a couple clients that will not open that mail and they will just open it, not look at it, scan it and email it to me. And sometimes, to be honest, it's a newsletter with no fiscal information at all, but they get so scared of opening it that they just send it to me and I'll do it for them. Um, and then at the end is basically what we uh, talked about. Uh, you will get the comfort of knowing you have enough cash to spend on your marketing efforts. And again, these are really vital to interior design. Um, I would say a large percentage, more than most businesses needs to be spent on this because this is how interior designers get their name recognized and get additional business. Cause we know a lot of this, you guys comes from referrals. I know that for a fact. So I hear, I hear this a lot from my clients that I want to do a photo shoot. I want to know how much a photo shoot is so that I can make sure that I have money in the bank to do it because I'm not. And we all know that that costs time, the time to put the photo shoot together. It also costs money to buy accessories, hire the photographer, take days, you know, that you would normally be billable and they are not billable anymore. And it takes maybe one, two, three days. Okay. So this is the end of the basic cash position or cash flow management. And I want to open it up to questions. Um, and I'm going to throw it back to Risa. Is that what we're doing? It's like yeah. The yeah. David Goldman thing. Okay. I just dated yeah. myself again. No, you're so funny. Um, so thank you so much. Just a lot of information. And what I had just said, um, and, and Noelle's laughing at your comment. She's saying, I'm so scared of those tax things. They sit on my desk until they pass due. <laughs> we want to encourage you to, to not be scared of, of any of this stuff. You know, it, it definitely, like, it sounds scary. And even like this Excel spreadsheet, um, what I was thinking, what we could do is share this working Excel yeah. spreadsheet with you potentially. Um, and, and it helps to know, we want you to have the power to run your business. And this is something I talk about on a daily basis, a, a day to day to day, like five things that you need to know about running a profitable design business. And it's looking at your numbers, looking at your numbers weekly. Once you accept that and you get over that hurdle and you have that confidence, your business will be in a much healthier place. One thing that I talk about a lot is tracking your time, even if you don't bill out hourly. And I actually learned this from Kimberly Merletti. Um, and, um, 
because she's given me a lot of advice and it's so interesting. I wanted you to talk a little bit more about the time tracking and how if you don't track your time, you won't understand your overall sense of profitability. Can you explain that a little bit more in depth to us so that designers really understand? Because I know designers hate tracking time. How are they hurting themselves if they don't track their time properly? Okay, so it doesn't matter how you're billing. Again, you always want to track your time. If you're billing per square foot, if you're billing on a lump sum and not to exceed, or you're just billing hourly. So what, what is really important is you're not only tracking your billable time, you're tracking your non-billable time. And what I do a simple calculation with my clients where I say we need to be 50%, like a principal should be on average 50% billable to contribute to her, to her or his firm. Okay. Um, and I, it's hard to go really fast with this research just because it's allotted in depth. But tracking your time will basically tell you if you build 20 grand for a project and you add all your time up with your hourly rates that you normally bill hourly and you find that it's a lot more, that means your lump sum wasn't enough. So there's a lot of, of reasons why tracking your time is directly related to your profitability. But basically, you're paying for these employees and you're putting your, if you're billing them at a fully loaded, a fully burdened rate, and then you're adding what's called a multiplier. See, this is a very long discussion. So we have to, multiplier is a whole nother discussion. But let's say you're billing it, let's say 120 an hour, just on average. If you, that should cover your overhead, your profit, your expenditures, everything. And if you don't understand what a multiplier is, again, we're going to have to have a whole nother seminar on that because it is quite the, the load, I guess, is the best way to explain. So, I mean, all I'm going to say in short, just because, again, time tracking, understanding time tracking is probably a whole nother hour of discussion. But if you're not tracking every, if you're working a 40 hour week, any of you or your staff, you guys should have 40 hours booked every single week. And I just discussed this with a firm that I scared kind of, excuse my friend, shitless yesterday. And I said, you guys better be tracking your time because you're not going to get bonuses anymore. You're not going to get any benefits because your time tracking, we're losing, I could already tell 10 grand a month because they weren't tracking it properly. They were putting under, um, they weren't tracking their correspondence time with their vendors. And I could prove to them they were losing money. Um, when you take on a project, every ounce of your time, even if you can invoice it or not, should be tracked as billable time. And that data will be used to bid out future projects. OK, the number one thing I see going wrong in tracking time is that people are scared to put in billable time. Just because you put in billable time doesn't mean you're invoicing it. But you need to fully understand how much effort it's taking to get that project done. And if you're not being honest with yourself, you're not being honest with your client. And they're pretty much getting you at a bargain. Yep. So. And, and it's a great, I love that you're saying what I say because I feel like not only does it validate, but it's really interesting because the, the perfect example I give is when the plumber comes and the plumber gives you a bill of $500 for two minutes of work, you don't question the plumber's bill. I think that designers lack this confidence, but designers need to remember that this is a luxury service. And exactly to your point, just track the time. Whether you end up invoicing or not, we can address that later, but you need to get yourself on the system. And, and there is a time tracker built on the Ivy app. It's very easy to track your time on the go. I even, and I know, I know there might be some other fields, and I know you have other clients besides designers, you have architects and builders, but I even have heard you say that you need to track your time, even if you're a GC and you bill out like on a bid basis, that you still need to track your time. That's correct, right? So it doesn't uh -huh. matter yeah. how you're billing out. I just want designers to really hear that, that even GCs should be tracking their time. Uh, even architects that I work with, general contractors, architects, engineers, uh, interior designers are all under the same kind of business model of project work. Um, all of them should be tracking their time, not all of their time, not just the billable time. Great. Okay. Yeah. Next question for you. Um, can, this is from Kimberly um, Harrison. Can you Hi, <laughs> this comment on deleting inactive proposals in Ivy? I didn't realize they affect the work in progress balance. They, you don't want to delete them. You want to make them inactive. You never delete anything. I didn't notice. I didn't use the word delete in my presentation. I said, you need to make them inactive or take them out of the project or something because you do not ever want to delete history. 
Correct. Yeah. Um, and then Heather Hughes um, was asking a question. This is the first year I'm up charging clients on products. So I'm very nervous about that, how this is going to affect me for next year's tax season. Any tips to make sure I can prepare well, myself to cover taxes? Well, Heather, is that her name? Heather Hughes? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You need to schedule a, non, a new client consult with me because that is a loaded question. Upcharge could mean a lot of things. And without digging into your numbers and identifying what you're doing exactly, we can't answer that question. And then the tax implication of that, anytime your revenue increases over your last year, if you look at what you made last year, just sit your income statements side by side. This is where your CPA should be getting involved in your tax planning. Mid-year, you sit with your bank, your income statements next to each other for the same period and see if it, it goes up. If it goes up, you'll probably have to pay more tax. That's probably the simple answer for the tax question. But the whole upcharge on products is fully loaded and like, again, a whole discussion of your individual numbers. And which, I, I, I yeah. believe when a lot of designers get started, they're just billing out hourly. Um, and then uh, what I've heard through the ID community is that people like get the courage and to you know stop giving away their products and their discounts and start charging like a purchase fee on products. So maybe they charge a flat 20% or maybe it varies by the product that they're selling. So I think that this is great that you're having um, you know two sources of income um, and maybe one thing covers your overhead and maybe one thing is your income. But mm -hmm different revenue streams. Um, and I think it's great to have that courage, but it's also um, more so, I think, really important that you're tracking the vendor tax correctly so that you know um, how much money you're paying to your vendors um, and creating a system. Ivy is a software to help you manage your business, but you also need systems around that. Um, and, and the best thing I always say, um, and this is so critical, like one of the things that designers don't outsource from the beginning is bookkeeping. They're tr they try to do their own book keeping, but it's really almost impossible to do bookkeeping and time tracking and marketing and XYZ and XYZ. So it's really helpful to find a bookkeeper, um, an accountant that understands your business and understands the software that you're using so that mm -hmm. you can really outsource that in the beginning. And, and I don't know your thoughts on this, Kimberly, but I've had conversations with designers about offsetting that bookkeeping cost. Let's say your bookkeeping, just making up a number, is $500 a month and you have five projects. Maybe you can offset those costs by layering that into like a project management fee for that project, something like that. I, I would actually not recommend that. I would, that's where the multiplier comes in and everyone's multiplier is a little bit different. So mm -hmm. if you are paying a fully burdened cost for someone and you're adding, you're multiplying that, let's say the fully burdened cost is like $35. The multiplier would be three times 35. That's where you would pay for your bookkeeper in that multiplier yeah. because the multiplier basically calculates what your overhead is per person. So right. you take what your average expenditures are and you divide it by 2,080 hours and per hour, that's how much you're spending on overhead. Um, and you take that information and you put it into a multiplier and you take your burden rate, multiply it by three. I know this is a lot of calculations, but this is, again, we can't cover this in 15 minutes. Um, that's where you're paying for your bookkeeper. That's where you're paying for your rent. That's where you're paying for your insurance. That's multiplier allows you to pay for the running of your company. Now, product markup or product margin should be determined based off the discounts you get with your vendors. So if I get a 60% discount with my vendor, I can have in my agreement, I'll pass through half of that to my client and the rest is my profit. So you need to have, my really encourage transparency when you do markups on purchasing. I hope that helps. And, no, that's really helpful. And what I was saying, and whichever way you figure out that number, I think that designers traditionally, from what I've heard, are a little bit timid to like spend money on bookkeeping and just what I was trying to relay is if you figure out the equation like Kimberly has set up for us that it's not a scary thing that actually by having that bookkeeper and understanding your finances is going to help you make more money. Yeah. You need to get your bookkeeper involved. I mean, it, there may be there one or two hours a week. Um, take them off for one of those hours and ask them these questions. If they can't answer these questions, we should probably have a discussion with them and say, I need you to start being able to answer these questions. Or if they just don't do it, then you just find a new one. <laughs> yeah. um, and then last question here, um, or maybe we have two questions. What is a healthy percentage to goal for regarding time billing at overall as an ID firm. I think we are only around 33% and it seems so low. 
33% of what? Yeah, what? I didn't understand that question. Okay. So every individual in the firm will have a different, what we call a production rate. So it's your billable time over total time spent. So each individual based off what you're paying them. And again, this is what I do with my clients monthly. I do what's called a payroll calculator and I'll take, okay, give me your full staff. In our first meeting, I'll say, I want to know what you're paying each staff. And then I'll start through questions, ask them, okay, um, are they an experienced designer, senior level? Okay, they're probably going to be more utilized than let's say a junior. So the utilization rate or production rate I assign to them could be lower for the junior as opposed to the senior. So I have a couple senior designers I work with and I set their utilization between 75 to 90, which means that 90% of their week has to be billable as opposed to a junior designer that's not as much billable. Based off those numbers, then you can come up with your budget is or what your target is for your monthly target for billings. Because I, I do that with all my clients. Each individual client has an analysis done and we go through what your target. It's different for every single firm I use that I work with. Yeah. And yeah. then last question here. Um, here in LA, lots of traffic and very spread out. This is from Noel. I oh, yeah. for drive. Should I bill for drive time versus tracking mileage and using it as a tax deduction? What are your yeah. thoughts? Yes and yes on both of those. Okay. Um, I've seen people bill half of their billable amount to drive to a location. It should be in your contract. That's a really good question, whoever asked that. You should have in your contract that anything out of a certain, especially in LA, I'm from San Francisco, so I get it. Um, you need to have out of a certain radius from your firm, you should have, it's going to be this billable rate. You could do, if it's within like a 10 mile radius, it could be half your billable rate. Whatever you guys decide, it should be billable. Travel time should always be billable, but it should be defined in your contract so that your client doesn't come back and go, why did I just get charged for this? Transparency is the key, you guys. You have to have it in your contract. Otherwise, you're going to piss off your client. Just saying. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Good question. That was a good question. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Great questions all around. Um, for those of you who aren't using Ivy, I'm going to do a quick little presentation so you can hang tight here for the next five minutes. If you do have any questions. Oh, her, lastly, Noelle's question was, is it still tax deductible? Oh, it's yeah. It's a business operation. Heck yeah. So the cost that you're spending, um, you can, um, you need to talk to your CPA though. Because it depends on what method you're using for the deduction for expenses on travel. Okay. Right. So just keep all your receipts, keep a mileage log, and then talk to your CPA. Awesome. And if you have more questions for Kimberly, um, we can go ahead um, and share. I'll follow up with you guys with an email and maybe even that spreadsheet, a working spreadsheet, so you guys can start yeah. plugging in those numbers and you can see um, how much cash you have on hand. And again, like Kimberly said, if it is a negative number, don't be scared. We can have a follow-up session and we can talk about how you can make that negative number positive. So oh, yeah. thank you again, Kimberly. We really appreciate it you joining us all the way from yeah. Washington, D.C. And yeah. we'll see you soon. If anybody has any questions, you guys can email us and we'll be in touch. And then I'm going to say bye to you and I'm going to share a little bit more about Ivy. So for those of you that aren't using Ivy, it's a business management tool made specifically for designers like you to help you manage kind of all the crazy stuff that we talked about today from time tracking. I'm so glad that Kimberly reaffirmed points that we talk about on a daily basis of really making sure you track your time. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that you can see how easy it is to accomplish some of the agenda items that Kimberly mentioned today. So time tracking on your computer, on your phone, very easy to select the project that you're working on, select the service that you're providing, and you can stick in your different rates. And then you can add in your description. Um, again, you can add a travel rate in here like we were just discussing, and maybe it's $75, maybe half of your hourly rate. You can mark it billable, not billable, taxable, not taxable. I recommend marking everything as billable as you're starting off. And then when you're going through, um, you can figure out if you actually want to invoice the client for all of those hours. So you can start a running timer or you can just go in and if you know you had the meeting and you know the meeting was one hour, you can just log the time. It's super easy to turn your 
hours logged into an invoice in our system. Um, you can even log expenses. So if you have reimbursable expenses or if you want to bill out for mileage, you can totally do that with an IV. Very easy to do that under here um, and very easy to generate out your time billing invoice. So I would just generate my invoice and you can send that out for online payment. So you can send it out for um, credit card or bank transfer, or you can take any form of payment that you want. Very easy to send this out to your client, credit card, bank transfer right here. There is a 3% charge for credit card and 1.2% charge for bank transfer. Again, up to you on how you want to bill out that transaction fee. Um, and your client actually gets access to their client portal as well. Um, so they, they can see um, everything that's happening and all of their outstanding invoices, anything that's past due, that's what the invoice would look like. And this is what the client dashboard would look like. So they could see any outstanding or any paid invoices here. And they can go back. Those are live invoices. They can go back and check them out um, and double check anything. So that's time tracking, what we covered a lot. What IV really helps you do is save time. Um, like Kimberly said, when you're paying your employees and you're paying them by the hour, you want to maximize their time. You want to make sure that they're sourcing efficiently. So what we've built is an IV product clipper. So I can go over here to my uh, website and... Um, Let's see the citizenry right here. And I can easily source a vendor pillow. And I can use my product clipper to clip this item directly from my vendor's website. So this product clipper right here, it is on your Chrome browser or Safari, whichever you prefer. I just prefer Chrome. And it allows you to clip items directly from the vendor's website. And you can click up to five items if you wanna give them some alternate views. You can add the product title right here as well. You can add the cost. So I'm just clipping the information. I'm not copying and pasting. I can categorize the item if I wanna know how, much, how many items I'm selling in each category. And then I can select my vendor right here and I can add that in. If it doesn't exist in here, I can actually add a new vendor directly from the sidebar. So I can write the citizenry and I can write my vendor's first name, last name, and I can save all of this information. I can add the description. I can add it directly to a project right here. And then I can add the full product details. So dimensions right here. I can just click into the hand very easy and I can save the product. Now it will go right into my IV product library so that I can have that item directly into my project that I'm working on. So let's go to our Big Sky project. Let's open up a proposal. And what happens here is that I can go ahead and add that item directly to my client's proposal. So this is great if you go to High Point Market or you go to Vegas Market and you have a bunch of items that you see and you like, you can actually clip them and pre-populate them into your IV library. You can house as many items as you want. And here I have the item right here. I can also see all of my products that I've already saved. I can add in as many items. It doesn't have to be just furniture. It can be service items. It can be lighting. It can be tile. It can be any products. And this really allows you to see, you see right here, there's a little eyeball so I can check out and see how much markup I'm making before I send this to the client. This margin doesn't look that healthy. So maybe I can go in and add in a little bit more of a markup percentage so I can be making more money before I send this out to my client. Maybe I want that to be 30%. And then I can double peep this. This looks a little bit better, a little healthier. Hopefully Kimberly would approve of that. And then I can go ahead and save this proposal, send it out to my client. We allow you to build out your proposal specifically how you really run your business. So here you can allow your client to see the market percentage. You can allow them to approve per line item. You can also group items together if it's items in a custom sofa that you want to fabricate. So you only want them to see it as one line. Item. We really allow you to customize. You can add an attachment such as a sketch or a drawing. Um, and then you can send this out to your client to pay you online. Once they pay you, you can then go ahead and generate this into a purchase order. 
Um, so then you can make payments directly to your vendor and you don't have to send them a separate purchase order. Super helpful. Um, we really understand the flow of what you go through. I used to manage a design firm and it was a very piecemeal process between Excel, QuickBooks, time tracking, design app. There were seven different apps we were using. Ivy kind of pulled everything together in one place. And then on the back end, we do integrate with QuickBooks online. And so that your accountant can really be working in QuickBooks and you can be really working on the front end in Ivy. So you have a purchase order, send it out to your client, your vendor, and then you also have a scheduling tool in Ivy. So you can see when things are going to be delivered. You can see to-do list items, and then you get your project tracker. And this is where it's really the Bible of your, the breath, the life of your project. So you can see at a glance, everything that's happening with this project. You can generate an FF and E schedule from here. You can bump it out to Excel if you want to. Um, and you can really filter to see how you wanna view this project tracker. With Ivy, you can manage your clients, your vendors. As I said earlier, you have your product library as well. The product library is great because it actually saves the link from where you clipped from as well. So pretty much everything all in one place. Of course, you can pull reports within IV for transactions, project payments, purchase orders, time billing. But for your deeper level profit and loss report, that would come from QuickBooks because that's where your banking transactions are pulled in. Um, beyond just the software, we do give you our awesome Facebook group that you can join. If you're not a member, you should definitely join under community. We give you access to industry webinars, just like today. If there's a business coach or a bookkeeper or somebody that you want to hear from, definitely let us know um, we strive to bring you the best that's why we brought you Kimberly today um, and then you can also reference our discover section so if you this is our curated network of service providers so if you need somebody to help you with 3d renderings and you want to outsource that if you want to outsource your bookkeeping these are all um, vetted through our system and our tool and they've been recommended from other designers so you can find um, whatever you need if you need extra design services um, virtual design assistant services ASR has a great service Service that she offers where she can come in and she can help you on the side and this is awesome because maybe what they charge you um, is $75 and when your hourly is 150 so you can already make a margin on this and and really not feel like you have to bring in a full-time employee pretty awesome community that we've created we also do in-person events we'll be at high point lots of exciting stuff happening there which we'll share next week on our high point market webinar and thank you so much kimberly for joining us today really 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 glad that we got a chance to hear everything about accounting um and we're very excited to maybe bring you back for phase two i know it's a lot of information we definitely want to make sure you understood everything so if you do have questions please feel free to reach out and thank you again for joining us everybody we will talk soon